Hey everyone, so it's Hearth and welcome back to my channel. On today's video we're going on an adventure down to Boss Castle, Cornwall to visit the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic. <laughs> For my birthday this year, I really wanted to visit the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic in Boss Castle, Cornwall. It's a place I've never been to before, but having read the works of Gemma Gary and Cecil Williamson, I was so excited to visit. And I'm going to tell you now, it was well, well worth it. It was such a magical place, and I will definitely be going back again in the future. I managed to film the entire time I was in Cornwall, and so I've split my time into several different videos. This one is specifically about the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic, a little bit of the history of it, my experiences with it, the items that I bought while I was there, and also a little bit of a birthday vlog thrown in there as well. So I hope that you do enjoy this video, and perhaps I'll be able to get across just a fraction of the magic of this amazing place. Cornwall is steeped in magic, and one village in the north of Cornwall is particularly magical. Boss Castle is well known to be a beautiful location, but it's also home to the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic, and that's really why I wanted to come to this part of the country. I've never had the chance to visit the museum, and I absolutely fell in love with everything I'd seen online, so I figured it was about time I made my trip out there. The museum itself is found in a beautiful pedestrian area as you're walking down the side of the river. And as you turn the corner, you see the large horned god figure, the little herb garden outside, the wishing well, and the large sign that says Museum of Witchcraft and Magic, and it really is magical. The museum has a really long history, and it hasn't always been in this location or in this form. There is a small section on the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic's website that really describes a brief history of the museum. Quote, the Museum of Witchcraft was the creation of Cecil Williamson, whose interest in witchcraft and magic began in childhood. Cecil initially founded a Museum of Witchcraft in Stratford-upon-Avon, but after local opposition moved to the Isle of Man, and in 1951 opened the Folklore Centre of Superstition and Witchcraft. Gerald Gardner, the founder of Modern Wicca, was featured as the resident witch, as time went on, the two men's interests became increasingly divergent, and Cecil returned to the mainland to set up a succession of witchcraft museums. Eventually, Cecil settled in the Cornish village of Boss Castle and opened the Museum of Witchcraft in 1960. Now, Cecil Williamson really wanted to focus on theatrical displays and exhibits that not only showed off magical objects, but also practice associated with what was referred to as wayside magic, this being the magic of common people, and so the museum is jam-packed with artifacts and spell remains from actual magical practitioners throughout the years, which makes it particularly powerful for those wanting to develop their own magical practice and draw on older traditions within their own modern system, which is one of the many reasons I was so, so excited to visit. You begin the museum on the ground floor, starting with a section about witchcraft history, what witchcraft is, a little bit about where the ideas of witchcraft came from before moving through an exhibition center. This, I believe, does change depending on the exhibition that's happening at any given time. While I was there, it was about familiar spirits and the connection to the animalistic self, which I thought was really fascinating. Continuing on, you get to a small section of artifacts relating to folk witchcraft, the different charms that were found within the local area, and the reasons you might want to use them, before ending up in what is known as the Wise Woman's Cottage. There's actually a book on this, which I have in my own collection, called Spells from the Wise Woman's Cottage, and this is a layout or a setup that represents how witchcraft may have been practiced by the local people, and it shows a representation of a witch's home, including charms, items, artifacts, divination tools, and other magical items all within a living space. The upstairs of the museum is laid out in one giant room, with small sections discussing different aspects of magical practice. There's a section on wartime magic, as well as a section on cursing, which this includes items and artifacts that show cursing being used in an active form. It isn't just what we see written in books, it's active magical practice that we can see and the people at the museum can actually touch. And I find that to be so intriguing, especially the ones where we have a little bit of background information as to why the curse was carried out. My favourite bit of the curse section is actually two dolls which represent two women that were in a relationship. These dolls are made of builder's putty, and they've been wrapped in Boots the Chemist ribbon, which is something that you just don't see today, even though the shop Boots is still around. 
and there's pins stuck in each of these dolls in different places, and it's believed this curse was laid by the ex-husband of one of these two women, which I think is incredibly fascinating. Moving around, there's also a section on protection magic, including what's known as apotropaic marks, or witch marks. These are things that I've spoken about on my channel before. You also have horse bridle charms, mummified cats, concealed shoes, and all of these other fascinating artifacts. Moving further through the room, you get to possibly the most famous portion of the museum, or at least the portion that I had heard the most about. That's the section including the figure Old Horny. Now, Old Horny has been in the museum for a very long time, and is a representation of the horned god or the devil figure within some aspects of traditional witchcraft. He's been through many different outfit changes through the years. He was wearing white, then he was wearing red, and then in 2016, they made him legs so that he could stand up. And now he's wearing a regal, beautiful green velvet cloak. And he's a very powerful, strong figure within this room. Standing in the far corner, he's a lot taller than you might think he is. This section of the room is all about the horned god and the representations for him that we find within modern practice and more historical tradition, which is always really fascinating to learn about. Out. There's also a section about the goddess, traditional rites, and there's also a large hair lady, which is a figure very closely connected to the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic. There's also going to be a little bit about her later in all of the items that I purchased from the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic. Not only are there individual items that represent spells within the museum, there's also whole collections that belong to magical practitioners. One of the most famous collections is known as the Reichel or Reichel collection, I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce it, and this was obtained by the museum in 2000. All of these items were once owned by J.H.W. Eldermans, and this magical collection is documented in a book by Troy Books. I will leave the links in the description box if you do want to learn a little bit more about that, but I thought that was interesting to note here if that's something you do want to learn more about. This section of the museum also has one of my favourite areas, and that is the Mandrake Collection. And this is one of the few locations where a lot of people will be able to see Mandrake roots. As you go back down onto the lower floor of the museum, you get to a section all about divination. This includes many magical artefacts of great significance, including Cecil Williamson's own scrying mirror, though I will admit my favourite portion in the divination section was this tiny witch mirror, and I'm obsessed with these. If I could get hold of one, I would absolutely love it. They are just gorgeous little witch figures with a mirror right in the centre, and it is just so beautiful. The final portion of the museum includes artefacts from significant people within the magical community, especially those that have had significance in the growth and development of witchcraft in the modern age. This includes figures such as Doreen Valiente, Gerald Gardner, and the well-known but perhaps not always liked Alistair Crowley. This was possibly one of the most interesting portions. Even though I wouldn't necessarily use any of this information in my own magical practice, it was really interesting to see the artefacts that in some cases I'd heard so much about. Within this portion of the museum, there is one item in particular that I was very excited to see, and that is a tarot deck. Now, having listened to several talks by people associated with the museum, I did know of a tarot deck that moved by itself, and getting to see it in person was absolutely amazing. But it is a set of tarot cards that has all been hand-created, and when they were acquired by the museum, they quickly realised that the cards had a mind of their own. Certain cards would rotate and spin of their own accord. It would never be the same cards, it would be different cards in different places. They're in a glass case, so really there's nothing that can interfere with them, and yet even on my visit, several of the cards were just not in a straight line, which I think is just so cool. One of my favourite artefacts in the entire museum is one that you would probably walk past without looking at it twice. And it is a candle set into a strange forked candle holder that came from the collection of Charles Wade from Snows Hill Manor. Now, Snows Hill Manor was actually somewhere I visited before, and although I'd heard of the magical collection, I'd never connected the dots until I visited the museum. Within the museum, there are a few pieces from this collection, but the candle is the one that stands out to me the most. It reminds me a lot of the candle betwixt the horns. This is something we see a lot within traditional witchcraft practice, and upon doing a little bit more research, this candle is truly fascinating. The information on the museum's website reads as follows. Within Charles Wade's collection, not only was there the candle, there was also a detailed drawing of it, 
and a text. Now this text is now translated and it's called Le Petit Albert, which is a book I have within my own collection. Now the translation of the text that went with the candle goes as follows. Quote, you must have a big candle composed of human tallow and it must be fixed into a forked piece of hazel wood. Then, if this candle being lighted in a subterranean place sparkles brightly with a good deal of noise, it is a sign that there is treasure in that place. And the nearer you approach the treasure, then the more will the candle sparkle, going out at length when you are quite close. You must have other candles in lanterns, so as to not be left in the dark." End quote. Honestly, if you want to know more about any object from the museum, it is all on the website. The museum shop is just as you go in through the main doors, and so you can do the shop before your trip or afterwards. I typically prefer to do the shop afterwards so I'm not carrying stuff around, and I knew that I would end up getting just one thing, I ended up coming out with a few more than just one thing, and that's because I knew that I wasn't going to be back anytime soon, no matter how much I enjoyed it. And also, I really enjoy supporting people who do keep witchcraft history alive and do support the magical community, and so I just had to get something. And so I came away with a few things, some are books, some are home decor, some are clothing, actually. So I have actually bought from the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic before. The biggest thing is actually this print behind me. This was for the 70th I think it was the 70th anniversary of the museum. It was created by an artist called Sin Eater on Instagram and I just had to get the print. While I was there I also picked up a few books, but in person it's really nice getting to see everything. And one thing I'd seen online but wasn't sure about that I ended up getting in person is actually this lady. She's absolutely beautiful and if you paid close attention to the vlog you will have seen her full-size counterpart in the museum itself. So this is what she looks like. She is a miniature, actually ceramic model of the hair lady in the museum itself. The detail is just phenomenal. She is so beautifully done and she is going to have a home sitting on the bookshelf behind me, I think. She doesn't necessarily fit on any of my altars, so she will be going on the bookcase behind me because I really want to show her off. She was not that expensive at all for something that is hand-painted and made of ceramic. I believe she was about £20, but the quality is absolutely phenomenal. This is the back, this is the front. She has a solid ceramic base with a felt pad on the bottom so that she doesn't scratch any surfaces and very, very happy with her. It's the one thing I did notice actually, the museum was so reasonably priced, not just the tickets to get in, but also all of the items. Nothing was crazy expensive, everything was, if anything, maybe a little cheaper than I was expecting, which I think is really nice because a lot of museums do have a tendency to bump up the prices when it comes to niche products, so I really liked that this didn't. An item that I actually came back for is this. Now this might look like absolutely nothing, it might just look like a piece of shiny metal, but this is actually a horse charm. Now they have a few of these brass horse charms in the museum itself. They were often attached onto the leather work when working horses, and they were often used to bring good fortune, abundance. They had different symbols on them that represented different things, so some would have a four-leaf clover or a shamrock. This is one that's actually been specifically created for the museum, and it is a witch. It says Boss Castle at the bottom here and she has a little cat riding on the broomstick with her. She is so, so, so cute. So my plan is I'm going to put maybe like a ribbon here, like a black ribbon, and then I'm going to hang it on the wall behind me. Maybe like here perhaps? I'm not sure yet, but I fell in love with her the first time I went and we ended up going back again. I think it was the day we did Tintagel. We'd actually left something behind in a cafe, so when we were there I popped in and I got her as well. She was £10, I believe. I will check and make sure that the correct amount is actually on the screen. Obviously I am filming this just after my trip in July 2023. Times will change so the prices may fluctuate, but as of my trip I believe that this was about £10. It is solid metal, by the way. There is no cheaping out on this. This has been handmade as well. This isn't something that you're just going to churn out from a giant factory. This is something that has all been done specifically for the museum, which I think is really, really nice. The next item that I got is actually a t-shirt. Now, I have seen their t-shirts on the website, but I'm really glad I waited to get one in person. They allowed me to go through the different colours and also the different sizes, which turned out to be really important. I initially fell in love with a bright red t-shirt, like 
vivid, vivid red. And then I realized, hang on, I don't actually own anything that I can wash it with. Otherwise, shirts like this would end up black and pink, which isn't really what I'm after. So I went for one of their black shirts and I'm so happy with it. This is the one I got. Hopefully, I can't see when I do this, but hopefully you can see the print on it, maybe. So this is what the t-shirt looks like. It has this beautiful, beautiful print on it. So, so happy with that. So that is the front. The back actually has the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic on it, like that. Very, very happy. It's really good quality, actually. They're all made specifically for the Witchcraft Museum. Now, just a quick note on the sizing. I like oversized shirts, and I would have got myself a large. I ended up getting a medium. These are all unisex shirts. I personally don't like the fit of women's shirts, so I always buy either men's or unisex and I would typically get a large, but having seen the large and the medium, I ended up getting the medium, I would say that they are slightly larger than your standard UK sizes. These are my shoulders here. I know that this shirt has got strange shoulder pad things, but these are my shoulders here. I typically wear a UK size eight to 10, and if I put the shoulder here, it comes out way over here. My shoulder's here. It's very, very big, for a medium, I have to say, in my experience, that might be different for everyone. So just bear that in mind. Normally I would have gone for a large. If I had, it would have been too, too big. So just bear that in mind. So yeah, very excited about this. And now I've actually filmed it. I can wash it and I can wear it and I'm so excited about it. I then did pick up one of their guidebooks. Now I got this after I'd already been around the museum, not before, but I'm really glad I picked it up anyway. Firstly, I am sentimental as anything. I will keep everything. And I'm talking about, I will keep wristbands from shows and concerts and things. I will keep receipts for things, anything with even the slightest sentimental value, I will keep. <laughs> and so I had to get one of these. I don't think this was all that expensive. I think this was about three, maybe four pounds. And it's a really decent guidebook. Inside, all the photos are in color and it has information about almost all of the significant things in the museum. I would say if you're going to get one though, get it before you go into the museum, not afterwards, because there's so much in here that I wish I could have known going in. I would have spent more time looking at the specific areas that were mentioned in the book. But in here, it's so good even after the fact. And if you never have the chance to go to the museum, you might be able to get these on the website just to give you a taster of what the museum is like. If you aren't in a position to go, maybe you live abroad. It could give you a little bit of additional information about these topics that you could add into your own magical practice. And I just saw in here something that some of you may be interested in. This picture here is actually the real hair lady that's in the museum. And then this is the replica. Isn't she so cute? So each section has information on it. So you have a section on the hair lady, you have a section on, let's have a look, magic in wartime, protection, the wise woman's cottage, a little bit about witchcraft persecution, the modern image of witchcraft, the history of the museum, it's really fascinating and on the back it also tells you the prices of admission so because I had forgotten for an adult it's five pounds children it's four children under the age of five are free concessions are four pounds family tickets are 16 pounds and a large family ticket that's two adults three or more children is 20 pounds and honestly it's so cheap for how much is in the museum and then lastly I'm sorry for the rustling I picked up a few books. All of their bags are branded, by the way. Look how cute this is. So I'm gonna rustle real quick. Okay, <laughs> sorted. Rustling over. Okay, so I picked up two books. Now, I had seen both of these before and I was really tempted to get them. I didn't, and so I waited till I was in the museum and they had a whole range of books. They have a lot of Troy books, which by the way, favorite publishing house. If you have the chance to get some, do get some, absolutely phenomenal. I just recently realized that Troy books was actually created by Gemma Gary, which is why all of Gemma Gary's books are published through Troy books. I didn't realize that, now I know. Troy books is amazing, but I got these two, which were also at the museum. So we have A Sea Witch's Companion, Practical Magic of Moon and Tides by Lavanna Morgan. I hope that's how you say their name. And then I also got Village Witch, Life as a Village Wise Woman in the Wilds of West Cornwall by Cassandra Latham Jones, which looks like this. And I was so excited to get these. I think 
Both of them were £15, I think, which honestly isn't that bad. And I would much rather go and buy books from places like the museum than I would Amazon, honestly, because at least then I know that the money is going to the right people. I'm gonna go through each of these books to kind of give you an idea of what's involved in them, but do remember, I've only just got back, I haven't read them yet, so I'll have to add them into another video in the future to give you my more detailed opinions. So the first book is A Sea Witch's Companion. Now, I have mentioned it before, but every time I do, people get shocked. I used to practice sea witchcraft, and there aren't that many books about it that I would necessarily trust or that I enjoy. A lot of books are really surface level, often incredibly basic, and while that isn't a bad thing, if you're past the point of basic books, they aren't necessarily going to be what you're after, so I was really interested in checking this one out. The information on this one goes as follows. This book is for all those who love the sea, who are thrilled at the sight of the full moon rising over the ocean, who feel the pull of the tides, and who have dreamed of making sea magic. You will learn how the moon, sun, and sea together create the magical ebbing and flowing tides, and how to work with them to ward off the power of storms. You'll experience the spiritual power and beauty of the goddess of the sea and moon, and learn how to forge your own deep and abiding relationship with her. The book will demonstrate how you can invite sea spirits into your life and make magic with them. If you wish to go deeper, it will introduce you to the profound occult concepts of the greater tides that lie behind existence and that govern our lives, births, and deaths. This book introduces sea witchcraft and its magical and spiritual practices and techniques, discusses the history, mythology, and importance of the goddess of the moon and tides and the god of the sea, provides an overview of the folklore, traditional magic, and folk customs of the sea and coastal communities, introduces rituals that celebrate the moon, the tides, and the seasons of the sea, provides instructions on making sea spells and magical craft projects, introduces deeper aspects of occultism and the sea, meditation, dream work, and transformational group rituals, discusses tarot and the sea. So I thought this one looked really interesting. A lot of the information in it I do suspect will be a little bit beginner, which might be great for some people. It's not going to be ideal for everyone. However, the bits that were really interesting to me was the idea of working with sea spirits, which a lot of books do not talk about, as well as the more detailed concepts that really aren't spoken of generally. So really looking forward to giving this one a go. Also, the print is fairly large, which I do like. I tend to stay away from books where the print is tiny, tiny. As I find it difficult to read. I am dyslexic. The words kind of merge into the background and it gets kind of funny looking. And also it isn't accessible for everyone. So I enjoy books that have decent print size, not too big, not too small. We're going for a Goldilocks. It has to be just right. The next one is Village Witch. Now this one really fascinated me. We hear a lot about wise folk and peddlers in Cornwall. This is something that Gemma Gary speaks on often in her works, if you have read any of them. And so I really wanted to learn more, especially as the Witchcraft Museum is in Cornwall. I wanted to learn a little bit more. Now the information on this one goes as follows. Village Witch describes life as a village wise woman in the wilds of West Cornwall. The first part of the book documents the torturous and sometimes harrowing journey to achieve this unusual occupation. It is a tale that ultimately moves through surviving and into thriving. Cassandra's past experiences directly inform her present practice and are intrinsic to being a wise woman. She acquires wisdom from actively experiencing and observing the vagaries of life. As part of her work, she travels around the country giving talks about her profession, and without exception is asked each time what brought her to become a village wise woman. Many people want to hear about that journey, and this is one of the reasons for deciding to write the book. Following on from this, Cassandra tells of the practice of her craft, which includes many stories and observations regarding the day-to-day -day experiences of a traditional wise woman, including her approach to magic. At present, the market is flooded with how-to books on witchcraft and associated themes. Almost without exception, they inform in an authoritative way, often including a cookbook of spells. There is far more to the craft and the wise than simply following someone else's recipes for performing magic. Yes. It entails old-fashioned qualities such as hard work, discipline, dedication, and commitment. This book differs as it describes the why as well as the how, and in that sense challenges the reader to question and explore their own experiences of the magical world. Yes, 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 okay. <laughs> that is basically my thought process as I was reading that in the shop. The text is also, you can't see that from that angle, <laughs> the text is also nicely sized, it contains pictures and images. I mean, look at this grumpy cat. How can you not love it? It's a cute grumpy cat. So, 
It has so much good information in it, at least from what I can tell so far, and generally the idea that it isn't a step-by-step how-to guide really resonates with me. As I found in my own experience and having spoken to many different people on the subject, that just following the words of someone else in the correct order doesn't necessarily guarantee a successful magical practice. Sure, you can get successful results by doing that, but without asking why and without understanding the deeper meaning of it, you aren't truly understanding why you're using what you're using and what the point of it all is. So I really like the sound of this book. I'm definitely gonna have to give it a read soon and then let you all know what I think. Oh, look, there's another cat. I'm a sucker for a good cat, like a cat picture, a cat video. My social media is full of them. So yeah, that is the other thing that I got and I'm really happy with the two purchases. They actually had a lot of books that I've spoken about in the past as well. So if you like my book recommendations and the kind of books that I enjoy, then it could be worth checking out the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic shop, whether that is online or in person and seeing the kind of books that they have because a lot of them I have read, I do very much enjoy. A lot of them are Troy books, so that might be why, but yeah. Very excited with this. I know that to some it might seem like a lot of stuff just to get from a museum, but I love supporting them. I'm not gonna be back and I love every single thing that I got. So that was my trip to the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic and I'm so, so happy that I went. Honestly, I was expecting to be a bit underwhelmed, mostly because people talk about it so positively. I thought that people might be sugarcoating it, but when I got there, it was far, far better than I could have ever expected. It was probably the best birthday I have ever had. It was so, so much fun. And so if you are in the area and you do have the chance to go, I would recommend that you check it out. I read online that people were saying it would take less than an hour to go around, but if you're like me and you're really interested in witchcraft and magic, it's definitely going to take you longer. I think I took about two and a half hours and I definitely could have taken more time. One of the reasons that I didn't was because I was with people to whom witchcraft maybe isn't a main focus, and so I really didn't want to bore people, but if you are by yourself or with other people who are really fascinated by it, you could spend a full day in there, honestly. I actually spoke to someone later on in the trip who said that they'd taken two full days in the museum, just taking everything in. And there's so much information you can gain from it. So many little plaques with details, physical representations of spell work and ritual that have been recovered. It is just jam, jam packed with stuff. And if you've never seen mandrakes, this is a place where you can go and see mandrake roots. It is just phenomenal. And it was also really affordable to go in. Five pounds for an adult ticket, if you're interested in it. I don't think that's bad at all. So yeah, I would love to know what you thought if you have been to the museum yourself. If you haven't, what is your favourite bit from the vlog that I've shown you? Is there a particular area that draws your interest? If there is, that might be something you want to look into within your own magical practice. If you did like this video, feel free to give it a like, it would mean a lot to me. If you do have any questions, comments, concerns, video ideas, or just want to chit chat with the community, feel free to post a comment down in the comment section. I do also have other videos from this trip coming out in the next few days and weeks. I have a video where I go to Tintagel, the birthplace of King Arthur. I'll give you forewarning, it was torrential rain when I went. <laughs> it was a very, very wet day. I also went to Glastonbury. I have a video about witchcraft book hauls coming out, as well as witchcraft decor. So if you are interested in videos like this, feel free to hit subscribe. I try to post magical content every single week. So with that being said, I hope you're staying safe. I hope you have a marvellous, magical day, and I will see you in the next video. Bye! Around me is just absolute chaos. Um, yeah, I'm very looking forward to getting this video done because I am surrounded by stuff. I've got jackets that I need to move and um, let's just put that there. I hope you can't, I need to close the door because you can see the shadow. It is just, everything is just falling over. Hopefully by the end of this, my life will be tidy again as tidy as my life can be, and I can go back to having a fairly clean filming space because honestly, there is stuff just everywhere that I need for this video. So what I thought was a new SD card with nothing on it turned out to be a practically full SD card. I just, and I mean just, got to the end of the intro and then it was flashing at me saying that it had no memory left. So I've checked it, it is functional, I've changed my SD card. In the past I've actually bought things from the online shop including, I just realised I filmed this entire thing without my lights on. Oh f <laughs> Okay. Guess who has to film again? Do da, do da. I. Ah!
ah, I forgot to turn my lights on, so now I have to film again. Okay, I so hope that that's good this time. So, here's how the timeline of this video has gone. I filmed it two days ago with makeup on that didn't look right on camera. It looked fine in real life. On camera, it did not look good. So I spent two and a half hours filming that video to not be able to use anything from that video. <laughs> I then started filming today, realised that my microphone was facing the wrong direction. Not a great start. I then finished filming to realise I'd forgotten to turn on all of my lights, so then I had to refilm the video again. <laughs> oh, and my SD card was full, so then I had to refilm that section again. So, yeah, now that's just the intro and the outro done. I have to do the rest of the video and then two more, so we'll see. We'll see. Is it going to lead to long-term successful magic? I don't even want to answer the door. I don't even understand who could be knocking on my door. Let's go check. Mm -hmm.